So hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, webinar on COP26 and the key outcomes, what it means for the region and the region's businesses. I'm Will Hargreaves, the Policy Advisor at the Greater Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce. Today we'll hear from a range of panellists on the COP26 outcomes, but just before I do that I'd like to roll through um, some of the key outcomes that we've seen from COP so far in this presentation. So with COP26, um, as, you, as it says, it is the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties. And really what it's about is uh, world leaders gathering to negotiate uh, climate action to prevent catastrophic climate change. Um, this year it was hosted in uh, Glasgow uh, from the 1st to the 12th of November, uh, where it saw a, a gathering of, of international leaders. Um, this year is, is very important as it was hailed as the, the COP to keep the 1.5 degree um, centigrade rise uh, in, in check. And for those of you that don't know, um, a global average temperature rise of above 1.5 degrees will give significantly uh, more catastrophic uh, climate change impacts than if it was less. Currently, we're around 1.2 degrees centigrade. So just some of the outcomes that have come from COP26. So uh, one of the main ones is that we've seen uh, countries representing more than 50% of global emissions, uh, which includes the UK, US and China, um, really agreeing to push on zero emission vehicles, as you can see there, making um, clean power the most affordable and reliable option for meeting power needs, um, but also looking at uh, high um, carbon intensity commodities such as uh, steel and looking at energy efficiency in those production processes. Also, there is a bit of a focus on uh, low carbon hydrogen and really pushing that to be an affordable, uh, renewable source uh, at 2030. So there were also other agreements made as well on deforestation, methane and coal phase outs, as well as fossil fuels and uh, zero emission vehicles, which I'll just go into more detail now. So yeah, you can see there um, some of the agreements on deforestation. So um, just cutting it short, there were um, countries agreed to halt the reverse uh, and decline of forest loss and land degradation by 2030. And those countries represent 75% of uh, the global trade market in key commodities that contribute to deforestation. This is quite progressive there. And then also, uh, which many of you may have heard about, there was the methane pledge. Um, so a pledge by nearly half of um, nearly half of the countries that represent um, global methane emissions uh, to reduce that by 30% by 2030. And COP26 has been hailed as the, the start of the end of, of coal with 190 countries having announced climate commitments to phase out coal power um, and 23 countries, including a commitment to end new investment in, in new coal power as well. And just finally, looking at the, the financial side and also the zero emission cars. So we've seen some uh, agreements on fossil fuel financing where more than 30 countries, including the UK, um, actually committed to halting the finance of fossil fuel development overseas and diverting any of that finance to, to greener projects as, as well. Um, again, on uh, zero emission cars, there's been an agreement between businesses, uh, industry and countries on um, the commitment to end the sale of new cars and vans um, that are powered by uh, fossil fuels. Um, and really move them towards zero emissions by 2040. Uh, in the UK, we've, we've, we've seen that that is actually going to be 2030 for, for low emission vehicles and 2035 for, for vans as well. Um, just on finally, on financial alliances. 
So I won't read all of that there, but um, there's been uh, an agreement um, of an asset base of 130 trillion um, that have been assigned towards the net zero transition. However, I must say that asset base isn't um, isn't all readily available as it, it's it's in the assets and so can't be liquefied and invested in in the transition. Um, but also the IMF will start a resilience and sustainability trust of up to 50 billion um, through the special drawing rights fund. So it's just a key overview of, of some of the very um, more well, some of the, the, the highest developments over COP. There were many more um, others that, that came out. Um, but in, in terms of, of today, we, we're just covering on the, the key ones. So, um, yeah, and if there's, there's any contact details, if you'd like to get in touch to um, discuss uh, any environmental policy activity across the Greater Birmingham Chamber or Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber as well. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and then we'll go to uh, the panel to get their thoughts on the outcomes from COP um, and really how the region and, and businesses um, could be impacted and, and how they're responding to, to the need uh, to decarbonize. So th thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, it's good to see you all here. And um, I'd just like to start by um, asking you to, to introduce yourselves to the, the audience today. Um, so uh, I can see Richard on my left. Richard, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, good morning. My name is Richard Kirkham. I'm the Operations Director for Morgan Central Infrastructure. Um, part of our scope of delivery of projects is based in in the Midlands region and we're currently delivering the A45 sprint project in advance of the Commonwealth Games which is getting energy efficient buses into the middle of Birmingham from the airport as smoothly seamlessly as possible. Um, I'll come back to some of the, uh, the the wider issues later after everyone's introduced themselves. Can I bring in uh, Martin Freer, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, Professor Martin Freer, I'm Director of the Birmingham Energy Institute, um, University of Birmingham. Uh, also Director of something called the Energy Research Accelerator, which brings together all of the, the Midlands universities um, uh, around a collaborative activity associated with net zero and uh, energy transition. And, and I'm sitting here at Tysing Energy Park at the moment, which is right next to the sprint route that Richard is responsible for. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that being completed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thanks, Martin. And can I bring in Helen, Helen Davis, please? Hi, thanks, Will. Good morning, everyone. My name's Helen Davis. I lead the environmental and sustainability business for Arup in the Midlands. Um, so we're the largest employer in, in Solihull and, and due to move into the, the city centre in 2023. My specific interests are, are really around sustainability, um, climate sort of science and resilience and nature based solutions, particularly across uh, major infrastructure, but also working on some really uh, locally um, relevant projects like the Commonwealth Games Stadium, the Alex game stadium in Birmingham. Thank you. And uh, finally, can I bring in Tim Miller, please? My name is Tim Miller. I'm an uh, engagement director for the Energy and Bioproducts Research Institute at, at Aston University. Um, so I'm particularly involved in working on the things that we've been researching for, for quite a while um, and bringing these forward into practical and productive use by, by companies, especially within the region. Thanks, Tim, and, and thanks all for your introductions. And uh, yes, let's let's hope the uh, A45 Sprint project uh, gets gets done for for, for Martin's sake. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, to kick things off really, um, and and just ask the panel. We've seen those COP outcomes, and I know some of you will be aware of, of some of the finer details behind COP26 as as well. Um, do we think that that the COP outcomes are enough 
uh, really for for what is needed. I'm, I'm going to start with um, Richard. I'll, I'll come to you. Are they enough? I'm not sure. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm going to necessarily say that I'm fully qualified to give an opinion on that. But I think they're more. They're heading in that right direction. So I think when you look at last month, next month, we can always get a little bit frustrated in life as, as to how things are moving. But I think if we take a, a one year, five year, 10 year view, things are moving massively. I, I do remember a long time ago when I was at Coventry University writing an essay about the greenhouse effect. And, and I told my dad and I told my family and it, it was tumbleweed. So where do I think we are now? We could always hope for more. I think one of the key things I'm keen to look at is how do we actually start to, we use the phrase, operationalize all of these activities? Because I think there's no shortage of advice and information, but using the, we, we've got to make sure that these things, you know, the rubber hits the road. Are we really doing stuff? Um, it's great to see all of the research coming to bear, but one of my big bugbears at the moment is, is standards and specifications. Um, if you want to change something, you know, you, you've probably all driven motorways where you've got large amounts of concrete barrier in the middle of the road. Well, what's the line of, how do we, we, we know we've got to do stuff there. How can we change the specifications and change them quickly? Because the ideas are out there, but they're not, all, they're not always permitted. So I think that that's, if you like, a, a back challenge to COP is saying, yes, here's the theory. How do we actually operationalize all of this? Yeah, I think it's, it's so hard sometimes, isn't it? Because with, with something like COP, it is very high level and, and we only really see um, the, the true impact on businesses once it's come, come down. But actually, you know, we are seeing a lot of businesses starting to, to lead the way almost in, in the role of, of climate action and, and really taking that, um, you know, responsibility a bit further and, and a bit more than how you'd expect a, a, a business to, to operate as well. Um, so, yeah, th thanks. Thanks. I'll just, just add a bit. So one of the things, for example, that might make us slightly quicker at a 45 sprint, uh, we, we have to use concrete curbs in this country like precast units that get delivered on a lorry as opposed to in situ slip forming stuff. And there should be an innovation to get rid of that. But curbs is probably the rate limiting step for the project. So if I could go in and slip form it, but I've got to get Birmingham City Council to adopt it. That's just one of the, would seem really small issues. And Birmingham, to be fair to them, they have to then say, well, how can I make the change? Because I've got this new product on my network. How do I maintain it? So there are lots of those type of challenges. So maybe Sprint's a, a nice example for us in the locality. Thanks, Richard. Good, good perspective there, especially from, you know, the A45 Sprint project as well. And so I'd, I'd just like to, to ask the question to, to Martin then. Martin, do you, do you think that the, the COP outcomes have, have been enough? I know that a lot of a lot of people were actually expecting it it to uh, not be as progressive as as it was, um, but there's also you know always a flip side to that as well. So uh, so yeah, Martin, what what do you what do you think? Yeah, I mean I think there's two sides to to COP, isn't there? I mean, it's COP 26, which means that we've had 25 previous goes at this, and uh, this is a 26th meeting of the conference of parties. It, but it's clear, it, you know, this is turning a colossal super tanker, isn't it? That you, you know, you've got to go uh, from a direction which was clearly counterproductive to our climate to one which is uh, everybody is lined up in the in the right direction. And 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 what we are slowly seeing is countries falling in behind this. And I think, in you know, what COP sets is that global context against what businesses then can decide what their directions are and how to invest and what we're seeing is that uh, we continue to turn in the right direction like cop, cop 26 was actually quite a significant one um, because it was five years since cop 21 which was the paris agreement and the paris agreement was when 
countries signed up for these nationally determined contributions. And it was reaffirming those contributions. So it was about 150 countries reaffirmed their contributions at, at COP26. That is the thing which gives you confidence that, uh, well, if they deliver, if, that we will get to under two degrees in terms of global warming. Um, and, and 2022 is a key year as well, because it's uh, there is a series of activities which happen through 2022 that countries will continue to have to uh, refine their pledges as we head to, to, to Egypt as, uh, as COP27. So, I, 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 there is a danger that people are expecting too much out of these processes. Um, they are slow moving, and it was good to see countries like India that uh, uh, no, no commitment uh, finally had a net zero commitment, albeit you know, 2070. Um, so it's good to see countries really beginning to recognize that they need to get on board with this. Thanks, Martin. And um, yes, yeah, some, some interesting points. And I was, I was reading that actually, um, if, if all of the outcomes from, from COP are actually met, um, it would still be just over a 1.5 degree Celsius rise. So it just really does show the, the challenge of, of keeping below uh, that, that temperature rise globally. Um, so H Helen, I'd, I'd like to come to you next. I mean, what, what do you think on, on the outcomes of COP then? Yeah, thanks, Will. I think, um, I think for me, I guess the, the game changer or the public is massively on side. Um, and, and I think the public want to take action as well. And I think others have talked about the need for sort of businesses to transform. And I think that that's a, a really key piece. And I think there was, you know, there was that kind of real diversity of voice from, you know, islanders that are facing impacts to, you know, to businesses and, and CEOs and, 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 and PMs and everything else. I think, so I, what I've understood is that, so yes, lots of progress, but there is no binding agreement across 197 parties to deliver the global set of nationally determined contributions. So those are the NDCs that would limit us to 1.5 degrees. Um, so we're not quite there with that. And I hear what others are saying. And, and yes, if, if we uh, reach all those commitments that are made, we'll be in a good place. But a colleague that was in Glasgow referred me to Mia Motley's um, speech that I highly recommend. It's eight minutes. She's a PM of Barbados um, and it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's just really worth a watch. Um, yes, so I, th I think the piece around the NDCs, you know, we need, to, we need to get there. We need to get there with that. But I think us all taking action from a business uh, perspective around transition is, you know, it, it's, it's lots of those small steps that we all need to take. Yeah, absolutely, and I can I can I guess echo what what you're saying, and I've, because I've spoken to quite a, a few people that have been up in in COP, and they said one of the the worrying but also you know powerful messages that that were being you know put across by uh, developing nations is that you know they're they're being asked to decarbonize, but also you know they're they're asking developing countries to decarbonize because their country is going to be underwater soon. And, and it's, it's kind of, you know, the ones that are the worst affected by the, the climate change are also the ones that, you know, aren't the highest emitters as well. So that there's a bit of a, a, you know, responsibility issue there for, for, for us as developing nations and, and businesses in, in yeah. develop, developed nations as, as well. Um, so, uh, Tim, I'd, I'd like to bring you in then. I mean, what, what do you think on, on COP and, and the outcomes? I think it's always going to be the art of the practical, really to echo quite a lot of what uh, Martin said. I think you, there very, were very high expectations, but it was also a question about what could actually be done. Uh, personally, I think the interesting things that actually come out, and in the business context, that is, is, uh, is in some of these changes, these broad policy changes and sweeps, because I actually think they set something of a landscape for both um, 
direction of policy, which impacts on business, but also investment. And I think the changes in the investment patterns, the move away from um, the fossil fuels, uh, stimulating activity investment and also innovation in those, those, those alternative areas. Uh, and I think one of the areas that we can, one of the things which we can really perhaps look to is the impact of that increased investment, reducing the prices of uh, more environmental technologies, um, opening up technologies which have perhaps sat on the, sat in the in the wings because they've been seen too expensive over a period of time. As they become um, more affordable, uh, I think that could have that could have an impact. Um, so I think um, I, I think in that sense, there's there's quite a lot of um, uh, quite a lot of room for some optimism from the point of view of impact. The other thing is is also picking up the, the point that Richard made about the um, standards and also the things which um, uh, stop um, the use of some some technologies or prevent some innovations uh, such as permissions. Um, we did a, a workshop with uh, 26 companies um, post COP uh, to look at how they are how they're working, what they're doing, how they're responding to these these environmental challenges. And certainly standards came up as something uh, which was really important to them and also also the permissions. Yeah, it, it's strange, isn't it? Because it's we, we've hailed this as, you know, in the media, it's climate crisis, the climate crisis. And it's really, you know, what what does that actually mean as a crisis? You know, can you know, can we start to, you know, overcome these standards and, and break contracts because it's a crisis? And it, it's also, you know, it's very hard, isn't it, for, for businesses and just to pick up on your on your point and, and add, add to what Martin was saying on the direction of policy change. I mean, it wasn't long ago before, you know, I remember when it was percentage carbon reduction targets for businesses. And now it's, you know, it's all about net zero since the government have announced that. So it's just an example of how these policy changes do actually <laughs> impact and influence uh, business and, and industry. So yeah, without going on to some, of, some more of your questions, uh, it was very, very clear within the workshops that businesses, and that's from medium, largest, largest companies down to down to micros, are all taking this very seriously and also they're very much engaging in the question. Yeah, so I guess, I guess that goes on to the, you know, the how businesses are, are responding as well, doesn't it? So um, I, I'll just move around the, the panel again, and I know we've touched a, a lot on it, um, you know, throughout some of the responses. But Richard, from, from Morgan Sindel's point of view, how, how are you responding to, you know, the COP26 outcomes, but also the, the need to, to de decarbonise, you know, the business more, more widely? So I think like, like many businesses, uh, we've changed what we, how we approach our allocation of company cars. So it's now you, you can't get a, a petrol or a diesel car anymore, and I, I'm sure we're not unique in that. Um, how how we do our work is, is for clients. We're a contracting organisation right across the group. We work in terms of fit out. Uh, I work in the infrastructure sector. We've got construction. We've got property services, etc. So we respond to a market where the client pays, and I, I said this at the, at the at the summit also, so I'm repeating myself, but we need to respond to clients that have a value proposition that equates carbon reduction, that equates biodiversity, probably gain now, picking up on your previous point. You know, it used to be net zero. Now it should be 5%, maybe 10% gains. and And that's hard for clients who are, cash strapped so how do, how do clients respond to the dft to say i'm i'm spending this amount of money and a little bit more you know i did a small exercise just on hvo fuel it was one and a half percent premium financially for a 98 percent 98 and a half percent carbon reduction so one and a half percent yeah we'll probably all just sign on the dotted line and get on with it if it was 5%, if it was 10%, somewhere else, an accountant, because that's what accountants are paid to do, will say no. And 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 that really, for me, is go back to that operation, operationalized phrase is 
we, we need to get the clients to help us respond because I think that flurry of ideas is out there. We've got some challenges around specifications. There's no shortage of ideas, but we have to give the clients that the sort of the wherewithal to be able to incentivize different businesses. So a bundle of contractors bidding for the next phase of Sprint, how cheap can you be? But how, how much carbon can you reduce? Can you actually come up with a biodiversity gain and many other components under that uh, current banner that we're talking about coming out of COP? So I think we can respond as, as businesses. Equally, we need clients to respond. Um, and, and perhaps from my perspective, I'd, I'd like to include clients as well as, as business or include local authorities as businesses. Thanks, Richard. And uh, yeah, Helen, I can see you've, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come in there and, and add to that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So there's just a few pieces I wanted to pick up on. Um, we're, we're talking about mitigation. So we're talking about uh, projects and the need to, you know, work to, to net zero. The other, the other sort of key piece, it's two pronged really. We need to look at the uh, resilience and the adaptation element as well so it's not just the mitigation element so one of the commitments we've uh, made on every project is that all of our projects will look to them to limit global warming to one and a half degrees and prepare for a three and a half degree world and just to give an example of this uh, we're working for national grid at the minute and their big focus is energy transition but they they recognize that the climate is already changing and so, and re so resilience has to be part of the transition so it is around the transition to net zero and the resilience piece for the warming that we already have uh, kind of baked in. And then I suppose just to move on to the kind of comments about, um, you know, how do we transition operationalize this? It's that piece. So, so the, the nature and the uh, carbon piece is, is part of the same question, question and, and nature-based solutions obviously will massively kind of support this uh, transition. But um, I mean, I, th I think one of the things that we just, we need to start looking at with, with clients and councils and, and local government is, is how business cases are stacked up. So the work that we're doing at the Environment Agency at the minute, so they have, um, yeah, they have biodiversity net gain target of 10% and net, and, and net zero transition. Um, so things like the typical business cases won't stack up. So it's almost re sort of framing the governance around business cases to get these projects off of the ground to look at the wider benefits across environmental net gain that you're going to get from putting in nature as Rich has talked about. Thank you, Helen, and, and definitely important point on, on the link to nature as, as well. And um, uh, Martin, do you have an, anything to add on that? I mean, what, what have you seen with, you know, businesses responding to COP and um, net zero more, more widely? Yeah, I mean, I'm extraordinarily impressed with how uh, seriously business is taking the net zero journey. And actually, the, one of the great advantages of having COP in the UK is so much activity and pressure has been built up over the last year or so. There's so much focus on net zero that just about every organization has begun to think or, or some way down the path of delivering how to, how to uh, accommodate that net zero transition. So uh, I, uh, across the Midlands, uh, we help support a whole series of businesses, um, particularly at the small end of things. So We've got small business support programs, and Tim is engaged in that, and uh, other universities as well. A huge number of companies, about a thousand companies, have been uh, involved with universities about uh, helping them uh, transition their business, transition their technologies to, to low carbon technology. So, um, impressed with how seriously business is taking this. This is extraordinarily difficult times, though the sense that one looks at the national policy context, it's still in flux. Uh, and for, for business to, uh, businesses to make decisions, one would like certainty. And you know, to be able to plan for the next five to 10 years, 
so that they know what direction their, their business is going. And, 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 and yes, we've had lots of policy documents. I'm sure you, you've read your good, <laughs> good share of them, uh, but they, they look much more like consultations than policy, uh, policy documents. And so you know, business is, I think, leading the way on this uh, and you know, scoping out their, their, their commitments to 2030, 2050, different horizons. Um, but things could change underneath all of our feet. And that's, that's a side challenge. Absolutely. And it's, it's I mean, we, we, from the members we're, we're speaking to, and it, a lot of them are finding the, the lack of policy certainty quite hard, especially those that are in the manufacturing sector who, you know, it, it takes a while to, to start planning and getting the supply chains up and running for, you know, breaking into the low carbon technology market. So it is really in, important and it is something that we've been calling for from regional, but also, you know, national government um, as, as a chamber, um, but also as British chambers as, as well. Um, Tim, I, I know, you know, we, we did kind of uh, cover a bit of what businesses are doing from your, your COP26 meeting with, with businesses, but are you generally, what are you seeing from, from the business community? And I, I don't know if you'd like to go into a bit more detail around that meeting that you, you had with businesses. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, again, I would, I would like to echo uh, Martin again, just to say that policy stability is really, really, really important, um, both from a business perspective, but also from um, the perspective of uh, organisations that are providing support to the companies with access to the new technologies, which will allow them to become um, uh, more environmentally friendly, meet the targets which have been set. So, you know, we are in somewhat in the dark in terms of what's happening regarding the policy as pertains to us. Um, with the businesses, uh, we are seeing um, uh, a lot of pressure coming down the supply chain. Um, so the larger clients are looking for these uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets to be put through their suppliers and their suppliers are coming to us and asking, how do we do this? What technologies are available? What practices are available? How can we how can we actually service this this demand? And some of them are actually looking very much proactively to say, well, there is this demand out there. How do I actually shape a new product? How do I take my existing products and how do I reshape them to, to fit within this, this new commercial landscape? So uh, I think we are seeing quite a big impact going through the whole economy from the, the larger companies, mm -hmm. but also being passed down through the mediums and the smalls. Yeah, I mean, we're all. This all just to add to that as well. It's we're seeing it from the public sector. I know that the government announced that any contracts over five million, the the bidders will have to, to uh, detail a credible net zero plan, which also includes scope three, the, yeah. the mystery that is scope three for a lot of businesses. I mean, I've, I've been speaking to some large organisations, and and you know, it, it is it is a big struggle on that reporting side. It's really, it's really difficult. Well, one thing I actually missed was that um, we're also seeing this from overseas, so that we're also seeing some pressure and demand from an export perspective, which again is, is quite interesting. So it, you know, we're talking here about region locally, but also uh, countries, uh, say like the US, um, even though you know where they where they are implementing, um, that is actually providing something of a driver, which again we're seeing regionally. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's it's definitely interesting and a lot of progress has has been made over years despite what some people may may say about about cop as well so yeah thank thank you all for your perspectives on that and it's really insightful and i'd just like to i mean maybe go on a bit more of a practical scale in terms of you know what do you think are some of the solutions or stroke measures that that businesses can start to to implement to reduce their, their carbon greenhouse gas emissions or or kind of manage it better to, to net zero i'm gonna i'm gonna bring in you richard but i know you know you talked about morgan sindel and and um the the low carbon vehicles over there i mean i don't know if you'd like to touch on on a bit more of morgan sindel's policy and and how they're actually reducing their their emissions um so if I, again, I'll, I'll use the, the sprint project because people can visualize where it is, but the, 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 
typical things that that we do you know we, we've got people strung out over six odd kilometers we have to provide them welfare that welfare you know demands water it demands electricity we've now got a welfare unit that only requires uh, if you like servicing three times a year it's solar powered the the um the water comes in in storage units both in the base and in the ceiling um it runs on uh lithium batteries there's there's many parts of the energy so just picking up on a on a welfare unit you know how many welfare units are used uh across uk construction i'll throw a number out there circa a million now we've got some fairly thirsty energy sapping old units you know how do we actually incentivize that supply chain to to get up to speed but i think the the wider thing is is the leadership piece is 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 what we're all talking about and i think everybody's on board and that's great to see we will turn that super tanker that martin talked about eventually um the bit i'm i'm keen to see is if, if like the shift in the cultural thinking of the staff on the job and that's moved in the year that we've been in delivery so the fact that the buyer is now going i want to go and buy an environmentally friendly or the best achievable welfare unit i want to go and get a uh, tower light that's that runs on lithium i want to go and get an electrical forklift mm. Th those things are being demanded we're do we're doing it almost not quite regardless of cost clearly there is a line but we're doing it and then we're advertising to the client how much carbon we're saving on a monthly basis so that when we get to the end of the project we can say yes we delivered that and the benefits under this cop banner were xyz um so i think it's really that leadership piece and the and the cultural shift of of people's thinking mm. I mean, just just to add to that cultural shift, I was speaking to a business who who are actually saying that you know younger talented graduates coming in are asking increasingly about environmental credentials, and you know, as as uh, the the younger generations come into the economically active side of the population, it is going to be you know pretty pretty big driver for that you know war for talent, and you know increasingly have a role to play there as as well um so martin I'd, I'd just like to bring you in really on on you know some solutions or measures businesses can take i don't know if you, you'd want to talk a bit about the, the ties the energy park and and some of the the engagement you're doing with with businesses there and, and solutions so on yeah sure i mean i the first obvious thing that businesses should do is uh, assess where they are uh, you know what is their energy usage uh, and how low carbon are they? What's their carbon footprint? So actually understanding the you know the business in detail is is step one, and then then step two is what on earth are we going to do about it? Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, ties to the energy part, the sorts of things and indeed the kind of business support platform that um, universities have, it's opening up the research facilities and research expertise that we have as a, as a university that businesses can come in and help. They need to transition the product from a high carbon product to a low carbon product. If they need to transition their manufacturing process from high carbon intensity to low carbon intensity, how on earth do they do that? How do they manage their energy capture, waste energy? We're working with businesses to uh, analyze how they do things uh, and then think through what solutions might be. Uh, Ties the Energy Park is a kind of real world uh, incarnation of an energy system. It's got, uh, sitting out the window here, it's got the large energy from waste plant, the Veolio plant, which takes all of the city's waste. So there's that, there's a biomass plant, there's a hydrogen refueling station. So I've just seen two hydrogen buses run past my window. Um, and it's a place where businesses can come and base themselves and be part of an ecosystem. So we've got a business incubator here as well. I, so there, you know, there are support platforms. So what businesses can do is reach out or should do, um, they need help, is reach out for help. And universities 
uh, a part of that, that ecosystem. But the other thing businesses should think about is the talent you were talking about, talent coming in, but actually the talent that they have already. And how do you, how do you reskill people that actually as things transition, you can take your workforce with you and actually, you know, the talented individuals within your business can set the direction rather than heading off to a business which is setting a direction um, that is more ambitious than, than your business. So how do you nurture and make best use of the, the talent that you have? Thanks, Martin. And, and thanks, adding to the, to the point there on, on talent and the skills, a very important piece as well. Helen, I, I don't know if you'd want to uh, come in and, and add to Richard and Martin's points there at all. Yeah, thanks, Will. I mean, I, I guess my what I just wanted to talk, talk about our journey a little bit over, overall. And, you know, I, th I think almost to be able to to sell and provide this kind of advice and consultancy services, we have, you know, as an organisation and, and as part of our, our values now. So our group strategy um, has sustainable development or sustainability at its heart. And it's, it's central to everything that we're doing. Um, we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals in 2017. And we're working towards net zero uh, 2030 for 2030. And I think the other key piece is that we've got this commitment that I've quoted earlier around contributing to um, all one and a half degrees on all of our projects and also pre preparing for the resilient side of things. We did make um, some key important announcements at the start of uh, COP, um, basically announcing that um, we will undertake coal life cycle carbon assessment for all projects, building projects, new and retrofit. Um, and from April 2022, we'll, we will not be pursuing any new energy product, sorry, projects that support the extraction, refinement or transportation of hydrocarbon based fuel. So we're really sort of starting to um, define and refine where we're wanting to put our resource and our people. But, but I think having a strategy with sustainable development at, at its heart is certainly really important to, you know, the, the younger generation and, and also to staff. So Martin talked about transition of staff um, and skill sets and, and, you know, bringing staff on board. Um, but actually, you know, this is it's just been a rapidly changing landscape. And this this whole piece is important to us in our as important to us in our personal lives as it is in our working lives. So if we can somehow align those kind of values, then I think we're certainly finding that people are more and more driven to um, pursue these outcomes. Thanks, Helen, and, and some good points there. And it's. I mean, just to add to, I guess, the, the acceleration of the, the transition, we, you know, we've also got the Environment Act as well, which is, uh, I think it's come into place, but there, there hasn't been many targets set. I think they're, they're looking to do it from 2030. So it's also another driver for, for environmental issues that just don't touch on, on carbon as well, that could start to affect, uh, well, will start to affect larger businesses, but could start to affect the, the smaller businesses um, within that, within their supply chains as, as well. So, um, well, I, sorry oh, to sorry. interrupt, but really key point. I'm glad because I wanted to raise that the Environment Act does bring in 10% biodiversity net gain on nationally and nationally significant infrastructure projects. So we're already now now that that is in there, we are starting to look to work towards that and that trajectory to nature positive that discussion almost needs to come up alongside the, the carbon piece. So that 10% biodiversity net gain is, mm. is, is, is brilliant. It's, it's really good. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, I think one thing that, that's clear from today is, is, you know, there are a lot of topics under the environmental agenda and it's kind of, we can't just work with them all in silos that they've got to overlap and, and businesses have got to appreciate the, the wide scope and, and try and engage with the ones most relevant to, to them and, and their business. So, um, Tim, I, I'd, I'd like to you know bring you in really, and, and you know, maybe you could talk about some of the work that Ebria are doing with, with businesses um, or any other schemes at, at Aston. 
Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we've actually been working quite extensively with uh, decision makers in businesses, um, really uh, working on how we can help them interpret some of these things in a practical sense in their own in the context of their own activities. So, what can they what can they practically do? How do they actually cope with these changes? How do they how do they benefit from these changes, and how can they they use them to their their advantage? What we've also done is back these up with reviews of practice and technologies. So um, there's a lot of talk about different technologies that are, that are out there. And what we've been doing on an individual basis for companies is actually working through what that could mean for them. And um, this could be new things that they're developing, or it could be things that they wish to improve, or it could be the impro improvement of their, their own practices. And that is really across the board, sort of looking at all sectors, looking at the, the business problem, rather than if you like inflicting our research on them it's uh, it's something which we, uh, we which we're which we're doing and i guess the third thing is that we're that we're doing is working on collaborative collaborative projects and demonstrators um so one example of that is that um we have a, a unit which is down near longbridge which is uh processing the um the results of tree management from across uh, the city of birmingham so from the parks from the roadsides etc creating a, a fuel to replace fossil fuel demand within a, a garden centre and then also producing a material which can be used um, to sequester carbon um, and also it can be used to increase plant growth and increase the health of soils and in the, the Greater Birmingham and Southern Hill area we're actually asking businesses if they'd like to come to us um, to, to look at use case or trials of this, this material as well as engagement in the uh, the other things that I've just been talking about. So we're, we're actively looking for them to, to work with us now, which, and this is a material which could help them decarbonize their, their position within those supply chains. Thanks, Tim. And it's just, there, there's so much that, that businesses can really get involved with in, in the region. I think that's something that I'd want to make clear to the, to the audience and the chamber can help direct uh, businesses to those, to the likes of Ebri, to the likes of TEP and, and some of the schemes that, uh uab do such as ali so um yeah if, if any businesses are interested please do get in touch with me and i can i can forward you on and, and help facilitate those introductions um so i think that's that's all we've got time for today um but thank you very much all for joining um it's been been a pleasure to hear all of your perspectives um and i'm sure the audience will be pleased and, and refreshed to to hear them as well so thanks very much and um yeah, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.